the next speaker will be uh, Hong Yang. He's actually from uh, my department, chemical and biomolecular engineering. Um, and he's going to talk about uh, a very long title, Physical Chemical Property and uh, Boss Generating Capacity Relationship of Engineered Metal Nanoproducts. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Oh, oh yeah. First, I'd like to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity and to <coughs> uh, present my recent work in this area. Believe it or not, this is the first time I talk about this topic, even though we had funding started very early on in 2004. And <coughs> you can see the challenge when we're working on this topic. And so today I'm going to discuss with you primarily on the <coughs> the ROS uh, generating capability of a copper nanoparticle, and we'll talk about it uh, and why we're doing it. And primarily the key words, probably buzzwords here, is engineering met metal particles. And why we're interested in, in such topic. And <clears throat> here's a couple of examples that uh, we want to talk about too much so-called nanotoxicity, but here's the thing that uh, <clears throat> Whether you want it or not, it, it's out there. So for example, the nanoparticle used in many different areas. We know they're using sunscreens and al uh, also many different types of additives. And even in the diesel fuel, you probably encounter, in some cases, the nanoparticles and to increase combustion. And so you know that the clothes now put in the nanowires are silver-based, and so on and so forth. And also, in, in other systems, that the newer system, you start to encounter particles as well. So if you, I don't know who, who you're going to believe to, if you look, believe the largest research information, then you can see the trajectory is going to go very fast, very quickly. So take a grain of salt here, but in any event, and this is already out there, so we need to take a little bit of precaution on it. And just generically, it's interesting, because now you think about toxicity. When you do any bio-related application, the pharmacology is going to always going to be involved. So you always need to know the toxicity, whether it's for the uh, intended or non-intended use of nanoparticles. So under that context, that is, uh, the rationale for doing this actually started early on. It started within the community that saying that since we're doing all this engineering nanoparticle, we don't want that to be another uh, GM kind of uh, uh, term term that is the generic engineering products. So a group of folks that started and, and championed this effort, saying that we probably should take a proact um, uh, proactive approach that examine the impact of nanoparticle. That started about in the early 2000s. And so gradually, people start to realize that that is a critically important issue. And so what happened in the recent years, in terms of most of the engineering particles, is in solution phase, in prim uh, primarily, the, for example, the quantum dots, or many of the so-called uh, super paramagnetic iron oxide particle, which is very relevant to the biomedical community, it's synthesized uh, by and large in the solution phase. What's involved? You involve the capping agents, or the gas A, for example, and then you, you, you put the precursor there, you have, let the reaction to happen, and you generate this dispersion in, in, in solutions. And you can make very highly uniform particles. For example, this is a magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles. And this, believe it or not, is made of pure platinum, but it's coated with surfactant. So all these things happen in my laboratories. So at one point, that people start to come together and to think about, OK, what are really the critical issues here? So traditionally, folks are focused on primarily uh, toxicity community, primarily focused on those kind of assets. So they know this very well. So from the, <clears throat> from the materials and from the nanotechnology areas, we are more interested in that. So there is a halfway we have to meet somewhere to understand this kind of system. So back in 2000, late in 2004, um, <clears throat> a group of folks have been invited uh, to, to come to Washington and had a workshop. And this is uh, the end product of that. So it created a review. It's actually all generated within a week. So we sit together and start writing all the aspects of it, what you need to characterize the materials, and what you need to be uh, <clears throat> done in terms of uh, analyze the toxicity. Right? You can recognize some of the names. Today is very active in the ears. For example, this is actually very active in skin. This is a Ken Dawson. You probably best know for, for this uh, protein and Conora kind of kosher based systems. So it's all led by Gong Tao Duster, which become my <coughs> uh, collaborator at the University of Rochester, uh, sorry, University of Rochester before I came here in January. 
And so we had to start a kickoff and from that point on. So what we're really interested uh, at early stage is that when I talk to my colleague in the medical center, I give them the iron oxide, they always call it iron. So every time I talk to iron oxide, and they, they, they're going to tell me, say, oh, your iron particle, I tell them, no, it's different, iron from iron oxide. So gradually it did become an issue that you have to analyze really the chemical structures. So from our first set of uh, experiments, and actually we started with, with iron oxide, there are multiple issues for that, so we shift the gear a little bit. So our first actually published work is a, a, a based on the different geometry or different morphology of platinum-based system. Well, what we have <coughs> observed is try to see if there is any of this morphology, surface areas, or the geometric structure can cause anything that uh, different among this class of materials. It turned out this is probably not the best system for us to work on in terms of get a positive response out of it. But this is a, if you're interested in more detail, this is published in a, a special issue focused on the na bio nanotechnology Yu Nanxia and I put together back in 2007 and for advanced materials. So what happened we see in that system is that we examine a whole bunch of materials. And if you look at this, this is one of the charts that we, we give out in, in that uh, particular research paper. And oh, beyond the diff uh, three or four different kind of geometry with the platinum-based systems, and this is a whole, whole class of different kind of uh, materials that we have examined. That include, for example, the different kind of copper particles we get from the commercial sources. And those, for example, these class of material, copper 40, 80, 60, 80, those are the GUSA generated, gas phase generated particles. So we just took it at the face value, say there's a 40, 60, 80 nanometer particles. I'll show you some image later. But it turns out there's huge dip, uh, discrepancy between what it tells you and what you really get. And so we do the, the reactive oxygen species assays. So this is a, uh, really the non-cellular based systems. So you, you, have the, you have the probe, so you, you activate it, and then you put your particle in it. And sorry, this case is not only the copper, there's some other things as well. And you, you, you observe the fluorescent color changes. So that's how we do this test. So, and then you measure the equivalent of uh, hydrogen peroxide generation capability. And that's the factor that we look at here is the induced the stress and before you're really exposed to the, <coughs> uh, to cause the cell, cell death. And so that's what we have uh, started in our work. So, and we examine in this system anyway, so we went through the whole thing, and sorry, we went through the whole thing. We also did the cell studies, and um, based on the human impact when the endothelial cells, mm -hmm. and because this is a lung program, they specialize going to obdusters, as well as my colleague, uh, Alison Elders, so we focus a lot of the <coughs> attention in this area. So we have the existing the uh, test protocol for the inclusive sex systems. But you can see it's very fairly nice. If you see the dose, <coughs> it's very, very high. This is still mass-based. And we go back and check with the <coughs> a different kind of cells, the other A549 cancer cells, right? So cancer, and so this lung based systems, and it's still very benign in terms of particles. So it's fairly negative in terms of response. And so we did the whole thing. Basically, we analyzed assets, including the uh, animal model studies. And so then what, what come out from that studies? And then we came back and saying, if we want to observe anything, we we'll probably look at something, even though it's, we haven't seen the, the true the, the human impact of it yet, but we still look, want to look at what copper particle really cause in terms of the high oxygen <coughs> RS generation capabilities. So we start to try to study this system. And people may show this repeatedly in literature. So this is actually 40, 60, 80 nanometer copper nanoparticle you obtain from the commercial sources. You can see they all aggregated, uh, uh, conglomerated in some cases. And then what they really refer to is the particle initially generated come out from, from the nozzle. So what happened there is that you generate on average some kind of 40 nanometer prime particles, and then they all aggregate. The in, in sensor it's not really 40 and 60, 80 nanometer anymore. And so we look at, we look at some from that point on, so you can see that if you look at the literature, you will see a lot of the inconsistent conclusions because the system is not really very well defined and it depends on many, many factors. 
And this also didn't tell you many other stories. And besides the particle size controls, there is also surface chemistry, which is really the, the biological environment, only environment we're going to see in the first place. Right? So we, we set to study <coughs> we set to study some well-defined systems. And our lab is special, specialized in nanoparticle processing, so we can make fuel cell catalysts. And we can make geometric control the magnetic particles, and we can modify the surfaces. So this is the one system we pick, and say so we use the copper particle that generate by using the outlier mean. So the outlier mean can stabilize particle under the inner atmospheres, but it's not very stable. So if you pull it out, it's aggregates, like the one you probably see in the gas case. So you need to put a strong ligands and some more constituents and to cap a surface. So we use that system and to study how the ligand capping on the surface and effect of the ROS, and so on and so forth. And so we choose <coughs> three different kind of ligands. So I use this uh, three, uh, three letter acronyms from now on. That is the Mercapto, uh, the, uh, the Mercapto octo uh, uh, carboxylic acids. So you have eight carbon chain in between, the thal and the carboxylic acid functional group. And this is basically to increase the water uh, dispersity. This is bind to the uh, copper particle surfaces. And so again, you have added the 12, also the 16. So we're playing around with the chain lens and see what happens. This is a very simple experiment. And so we will try to see whether they cause any difference. Right here, we have very well defined systems. They all have a similar size. All we change is the ligand on the surface. So it's a simplified problem dramatically. So we examine the particles. And if you just use the freshly made, protected by these ligands, and you do an x-ray, even though you expose the air, you only see, mostly you see is copper. You see briefly a little bit. And that is for the uh, uh, copper 2, o uh, oxygen 1. So it's the, sorry, uh, oxygen 1 and, and reaction systems. By the way, most of the work I presented here is by the Ms. Miao Shi. He, he's, uh, she's still working in my lab. It's graduating probably within a year. And what happened here, if you check with the uh, fingerprint structures of the molecule on the surfaces, you can see all this leg and, and cap on the surfaces. So this is basically the total reflective the infrared spectroscopy studies of the nanoparticles. You can see all this leg and shows up. And also, by the way, this work is uh, recently published in the ACS Nano. Uh, <clears throat> and what happened then is this. All the amine can be replaced by all these uh, capping agents. To what degree is we're still looking at it? And then we use this and to examine, again, the ROS response. What happened, this is the general conclusion. So you, you increase the mass dose. What happened? Because the particle size is very similar. So we can avoid the consideration or eliminate somewhat the consideration of the surface versus the mass, right? But there's still this issue going to involve. I'll tell you later a little bit more. That is, with increase the <coughs> copper amount, you can see the uh, ROS response goes higher, and, and so that's obvious. But this is the problem more important to us, that you have a longer chains, and it is so, so a little bit lower ROS response. So basically, if you look at any given mass dose, what happened here, you can start showing from 8 carbon chain to, to 12 to 16, it goes down quite, quite dramatically. So that tells us the surface has a very important effect uh, on the ROS generation capability. So what's going on there? So what we think is going on here is that there is this cap, capping agent, cap on the surface, but the oxygen still can permeate it through, the, through the, the soft layers. And so what happened here, you start to see surface changes over time when you expose that to air. So that tells you there is oxidation reaction happens. So indeed, after a certain time of exposure, you start to see this little pic shows up. And if you look at the uh, TM, the transmission electron microscope uh, images or micrograph, you start to see the EO defined structure, and you also start to see the shell layer. So you can see whether it can blow up. Now this is a blow up of the one of these systems. So you can start to see, let's say, the development of the first, not very crystallized, the oxide on the shells, and then over time start to crystallize from the copper two oxygen one structures. So you can marry the lattices to confirm all the structures. So there, there is this indeed something happens there. 
so what happened here uh, subsequently is this. Then if you look at the equivalent of uh, uh, peroxide generation capability, it went down dramatically. And, but if you also compare this to the trend still maintained. So that means if you oxidize surface, and you, you really ha have the ability to reduce the ROS generation capability at the same time. So that is kind of uh, quite uh, uh, intriguing to us. And so we can study the <coughs> uh, all these phenomena in, in a little bit more details. And so that's what we're, we were doing at the moment. So we basically have a system that we can control the surface chemistry by ligands. And you can also control oxidation on the surface by the exposure time uh, in air or in oxygen. And so this gave us some leverage to look at this in a little bit more details. So but basically what happened here is this. So this is one of the systems that uh, we use UV to follow through this generation capability. For this three system, and there is slight difference in terms of if you measure one decade, there are peak shapes. This is ab not absolute kinetic, but it represents the decay correlated oxygen formation. It's not quantitatively, but it's close enough. Right. You can start to see the decay, so that's why we don't call it really kinetic uh, parameters uh, per se, especially when you can go into your department. So, uh, <coughs> so well, basically, this tells you that you do have this uh, very strong generation capability in this sense. Now, because of the time, I'm running short on time, so I can only show you a couple of uh, uh, ongoing work related to the cell viability study, I think that's quite intriguing related to what we observe for the ROS generation capability. And that is, uh, <coughs> and of course, this all linked to the aggregation kinetics, so how the particle aggregates and start to set uh, it in solutions. So there's also the dissolution issues. So I'll show probably at some other point, other time, and the protein absorption studies as well. So on that note, we also do some la other ligands, for example, uh, pack-based systems. So that is a very different to the dissolution kinetics. So that's very intriguing uh, to us. Uh, so this very quickly show you one of this, the, the uh, dynamic light scattering study is showing the particle really, once in the solution, it still form the aggregate. So this is a hydrodynamic radius for all these three different types of class of materials. Uh, what is interesting here is that if you go back and test the, um, the in vitro uh, cell viability study, there is trends. I only show you the carbon eight, eight carbon chain structures. What you see here, if you had the four hours and 24 hours, uh, the endpoints, if you check what happened here for the eight carbon eight system, a couple of it will be observed uh, fairly well. That is, you start to see the dramatic decrease Let's see, at roughly about uh, 50 milligram, uh, microgram per mi milliliter concentrations. And this goes beyond that. If you, if you do the, <coughs> the, the other two cap systems, it's go beyond to about, uh, count to about uh, 100, uh, 100 microgram per milli uh, milliliter. If you go to the 24 hours, i.e. the one day endpoints, uh, you, you see this trend uh, even more ob obvious. And this is a, look at this, this is a, one of the stress causing the systems. And this is another one to couple with that. That's the luciferous activity reporter studies. So you can start to see the same system. You can start to observe the cell, uh, cell death and some of the correlated stress induced, and but it ha hasn't caused the cell death. And this is reflected in that, in these two slides. Right, so you start to see at the four hours, and the stronger signal come from roughly about 25 to 50. And if you look at the 24 hour stem, it goes around 10. 10 micrograms. So that represents some of the cell already died by this time, right? So you can start to see, either from the previous range, start to see the response of the, uh, the particle caused the stress in the, in the cells, and then the second one is delay. Some of them die, some of them still, uh, still, uh, still maintain the uh, maintain variables. So that's basically the current study we have at, at this time. So hopefully, for the very short uh, 15 minutes, I tell you the story that is surface is really critically important. So we use a positive uh, <coughs> part, uh, the, the particle with a positive response and show you a couple of things that we control that and study it. That is oxidation on the surfaces and also the capping agent with that effect on the surface in terms of toxicity. So finally, I want to acknowledge my students. And as I mentioned it, these are the two current students and involve particle synthesis. And Miao Shi doing most of the cell study binding and also, also the synthesis and surface ligand change and so on and so forth. 
is a couple of other uh, former students uh, who got involved with this project, and they're all somewhere else now. And Chairman Peng is the postdoc and still at the Berkeley looking for a position at the moment. And the collaborators, a long time collaborators, is Addison Elder, who started the first set of EPA grants when they started the nanotoxicity study back in 2004. And, and then it's later on, we, there's DOE program getting, the MURI program, and uh, led by uh, uh, Donta of Doster. So we got involved in there, and also some of the center grants that you, Rochester and Carney is sponsored by the uh, NIH, exactly from NCI, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it's money from somewhere else. So thank you for your attention. Yes, Kate. Okay. So are your leads also oxidizing during all this process here? I mean, aren't you able to test that? Or have you done experiments with cells with the free ligands to see how that affects things as well? Yeah, we, ha we haven't tested yeah. free ligand. Um, we probably can easily test that. Sure. That's actually, especially for the, the fluorescent RS-based uh, study. So that, that would be an easy thing for us to do. Um, the control, we, I, if I remember correctly, the control we did is not using the surfactant, but anything else we use. Probably my student did that as well, but I need to follow up. But it's a, that's one thing we should take a look. And the most interesting one is the cell, yeah. cell studies, so. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so I want to ask, does the ROS generation depend on the different cell types you use? And also for the in vitro assay where you do the ROS, the proper interaction with the hydrogen, like uh, or radish peroxidase, is that sort of known or does that affect the loss generation as well? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So when we, when we submit the paper to ACS Nano and the referee raised the same, same question. So we use the protocol um, developed by other lab and test it. So if you see, it's a couple also very well with our uh, cell viability study. So the, we use, we, we use with the protocols, use the hot radius systems. So some of them, they add it different, differently. And the paper we, 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 we saw is actually very high baseline. And the dose level is also very high uh, in those studies. So there's not completely in agreement, but also because probably the particle size as well. Answer your second question related to the <coughs> other cells. Uh, I believe it will cause a difference. Different cell, the response could be different, especially the ROS assay in the first place. And but how big? And, in terms of uh, differences among different cell lines, that's something that uh, we haven't looked at. It It should have a difference. Yeah. I also had a question. In these type yeah. of studies, um, the biological effect, is it caused by the particle, whatever it is, or is it at times also by the dissolution of metal on the particle? That's, a, that's a also a question we are looking at here. And one of the things, uh, if you, if you look at the uh, oxidation, it's fairly slow. Mm -hmm. So what, what we think that it will be a good study for us to do is to uh, measure the radical formation and correlate it to mm -hmm. ROS. And so actually, one of my friends at the FDA uh, is helping us um, on doing those things. So. The no more questions? Thank you very much. All right, thank you.